grab some imaginary popcorn because we're going to take a quick trip to the movies. The scene goes like this. A bridge is about to collapse because a supervillain has weakened the supports to the point where the entire thing is going to crumble into the river. As the bridge creaks and teeters, our superhero learns about the crisis and races to the scene. She's the only person with the strength to advert catastrophe and save hundreds of lives. Our superhero is less than 10 seconds from the bridge now, but as she gets closer, a voice in her head reminds her of the time she face-planted while doing a somersault in elementary school. A couple seconds later, she recalls her father telling her that it would be best if she set her sights low for the future. With the bridge in sight, another vision emerges in front of her, her former best friend ridiculing her for her delusions of grandeur. Rubble from the bridge topples into the water. The creaking gets louder. The screams of dozens and dozens fill the air. And our superhero, overwhelmed with doubt, sits down by the side of the road, covers her face with her hands, and drowns in self-pity. Wait, what? You've never seen that scene in a superhero movie, right? There are some reasons for that. One is that it would be a terrible story. Another is that, regardless of the darkness in their pasts, or the moral conflicts they might be facing, superheroes don't become true superheroes by giving in to limiting beliefs. Superman doesn't think that maybe on a good day he might be able to leap a tall building, or maybe, you know, a couple of stories at least. Tony Stark doesn't think, this Iron Man suit is probably going to fail me at the worst possible time because I'm inherently a screw-up. Captain Marvel doesn't break through our atmosphere and suddenly start thinking, I'm not sure I have the emotional capacity to fly solo through space. They have superpowers, and any sense of restriction be damned. And you know what? You have superpowers too. How do you realize them? You begin with your mindset. Finding my Roger Bannister when I was a kid, maybe 9 or 10 years old, we had a big family reunion. There were a couple dozen of us around a huge table in a big, busy restaurant. It was a Saturday night, so the place was packed, and the wait staff ping-ponging from table to table as quickly as they could. A few minutes after we all gathered, our waitress came over to take our order. As you can imagine, this was a lengthy process. After halfway through, the waitress came around to ask me what I wanted to eat and drink. It was then that I realized she hadn't been writing down anything my relatives had ordered. I found this extremely curious. There were something like 25 of us, and I'd seen her serving other customers, so I knew we weren't her only table. How was she possibly going to remember everything we'd ordered? I told her what I wanted and then watched carefully as she made her way around the rest of the table. I did not have a high level of confidence that my meal was going to remotely resemble what I'd requested. Even at that age, I had a healthy amount of skepticism. Not because I was a negative person or because I didn't have faith in people, but rather that I needed to see anything out of the ordinary before I believed it was possible. In this case, I figured that, at best, the waitress would get most of our orders correct, but she'd wind up putting them down in the wrong places, and we'd find ourselves trading plates all across the table. Well, first our drinks came, and everyone got exactly what they wanted. Even the cousin who wanted no ice in her soda and another who'd requested that her drink come with a twist of lemon, a twist of lime, and two cherries. Okay, I thought, that was pretty good, but there's a lot more to come. A few minutes later, the salads came out, and again, everything was perfect. The people who wanted their dressings on the side got it that way. The people who wanted their dressing tossed in their salads got that. 
and everyone got the dressing they asked for. My skepticism was being tested, and then the main courses were delivered. Not one mistake, and there were some crazy special requests. Everything was cooked the way we wanted, and all the side dishes were the right ones. I dove into my meal at that point, but I couldn't stop thinking about what the waitress had accomplished. At this age, I only just begun to read competently, and my brain injury had caused me all kinds of learning challenges. And yet, here was someone who showed me that our brains are capable of far more than I would have imagined. That waitress was my Roger Bannister. Bannister was a track star in the 1950s. In the early years of Bannister's career, it was widely assumed that it was physically impossible for an athlete to run a mile in less than four minutes. The feeling was that our bodies would break down from the effort before the time could be achieved. Then, on May 6, 1954. Bannister ran a mile in three minutes and 59.4 seconds, proving that the four-minute barrier was indeed breakable. What is most interesting to me is that less than two months later, someone broke Bannister's record, and then that record was broken, and then that one. The times have been dropping ever since. What Bannister did was show that this barrier wasn't, in fact, a barrier at all. That was what the waitress showed me. Through her, I saw that what I'd perceived my brain capacity to be was so much less than what it really was. As you know, I continued to struggle with learning for many years, but from the moment of that dinner. I had a model for what was possible. The waitress in this way was limitless. She demonstrated something in front of me that I would never in a million years have thought possible. I never got to know her, but I'm forever grateful because what she did for me personally was to permanently change my perceptions of my own restrictions. She altered my mindset. It was impossible for me to buy into the notion that I could expect to accomplish only a modest amount with my brain when I knew that others could achieve so much more. I just needed to find a method. I'm going to share much of that method with you in this book. At its core is one fundamental concept: unlimiting. The key to making yourself limitless is unlearning false assumptions. So often we don't accomplish something because we've convinced ourselves that we can't do it. Let's go back to Roger Bannister for a moment. Every day before May 6, 1954, people were absolutely certain that a sub four-minute mile was beyond the range of human capabilities. Forty-six days after Bannister did it, someone else beat his time, and more than fourteen hundred racers have followed them. Running a mile in less than four minutes is still an extraordinary feat, but it is not an impossible feat. Once that barrier was broken, many achieved it. So, how do you face down limiting beliefs? What limiting beliefs do to us? Fredrickson refers to this as the broaden and build theory because positive emotions broaden your sense of possibilities and open your mind, which in turn allows you to build new skills and resources that can provide value in other areas of your life. The theory, together with the research reviewed here, suggests that positive emotions one broaden people's attention and thinking, two. Undergo lingering negative emotional arousal. Three, fuel psychological resilience. Four, build consequential personal resources. Five, trigger upward spirals towards greater well-being in the future. 
and six, seed human flourishing. The theory also carries an important prescriptive message. People should cultivate positive emotions in their own lives and in the lives of those around them, not just because doing so makes them feel good in the moment, but also because doing so transforms people for the better and sets them on paths towards flourishing and healthy longevity. The new mindset that comes from silencing your inner critic presents you with a world of possibilities. When you're surging with positive emotions, you're seeing and seizing on opportunities you might never have noticed before. And with a high sense of motivation, and really, how could you not be motivated by this and the right methods, you're well on your road to becoming virtually limitless. Before we move on, to learn faster, we must transcend the narrow definition of what we believe is possible for ourselves. In the following pages, you'll learn about the seven learning lies that are the most common limiting beliefs that hold people back. I've seen students and clients cling to these beliefs throughout my decades of teaching people how to learn. These restrictions are the only real barrier you face. After all, people can't learn to read faster if they believe it isn't possible. They can't learn to memorize things more efficiently if they keep telling themselves they have a bad memory. Everything else falls into place once you snap out of the trance of these so-called limitations. By tackling these lies, you'll be tackling the core blocks that keep you from being limitless. Here are a few things to try before going to the next chapter. Think of a time when you saw someone accomplish something that truly impressed you. Now think about what personal inspiration you can draw from that. Reimagine your inner critic. Change the attributes of the voice in your head so you can begin to give it less credence. Face down one limiting belief right now. What do you regularly tell yourself you can't do? Find the evidence that shows you that this belief isn't true. All right, here is a very special chapter chat, and this is a first to the world. For everybody listening to this all around the world, I'm very proud to introduce my friend and my business partner for over 12 years, Alexis Bank, co-founder of Quick Learning and Quick Brain. When I say this is a first is because I have the easy part. I get to be on stage and be on video and uh, and speak and teach, but people don't realize there's a whole village behind and and Alexis leads that village. You know, this book and certainly this business wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for her. And you just heard her story here in this chapter where she came to the United States um, with her with her family and they didn't have any money or education or resources, but they had a dream. And and so Alexis, thank you for thanks for coming on here. I know this is a little bit different. You're usually the one producing our podcast and producing our videos and, and our app and everything that we do and all our courses that we have. But this is a real treat, so so thank you. Well, thank you so much for dragging me out of my crab hermit mode. <laughs> yeah, she she's she's literally wears so many hats in this business, and she's always behind the scenes, and she's the one that makes this all work. So how do you how does it feel to you immigrated to this country? A lot of people, you know, we all have a story, and no story is better or or less than anybody else's. We all have our difficulties. And sometimes difficulties, they could define you or they could develop you. I mean, how did you feel when you came into this country and you didn't have the language and you didn't? I mean, now you run, you run a big business, an international business. You know, with, we have students in every country in the world, videos that, that touch hundreds of millions of people. We would be able to do that. We build, because of you, we build schools everywhere from Guatemala to Kenya. But being that little girl in elementary school, I mean, did you see all that back then? 
Oh my god, not even in my dreams, no. <laughs> it's really surreal, and I was daydreaming about this. Maybe not to this magnitude, but certain things when I was young. And I truly believe none of us really know and understand what we're really capable of when we put our mind to it. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're walking testament to that, you know, because a lot of people look to external resources. It's like, oh, I don't have the money or I don't have the education or I don't know people. But I mean, there are people like yourself who, who also don't have those kind of resources, but you have resources inside of you. So, you know, what would you tell somebody who's listening to this? This chapter really is all about mindset and that there are these limitations and that these scripts that we have, we could easily have said the limits are, oh, I don't have the school, I don't have the language. Now you speak, you know, multiple language and you run business and you're this amazing female entrepreneur. You're a new mother. I mean, what advice would you give to somebody listening to this that thinks like, oh, I'm so far away from that. Nobody believes in me. You know, I, I, I really want, I know there's something deep down that's possible, but when you're like, eating lunch in a bathroom stall by yourself because you don't know, you don't have friends in school and even you don't know how people are, are talking because you can't understand the language. What would you say to that person? One thing that I would, I can say and I know <laughs> that is true is that everything can be figured out. Mm. Everything. If someone's done it, then it's doable. It's not impossible, and I realize that. And once I realize that, maybe I just didn't know the how, but it did not mean that it can't be done. So I still practice every day, even in our business. If we want to do something, it's like, oh, well, someone's done it. So mm -hmm. let's figure out how, and let's apply that. That's been my process for so long, <laughs> even down to the smallest thing. Like, what is one thing? If I want to work out, then okay, somebody's working out. What are they doing? So I've just really gone out there and I observed so many people and how they're doing certain things or why they're doing it. I always joke with my friends that I was kind of lucky that I didn't have too many friends growing up because it gave me a lot of time to observe and mm. learn. I was just taking in a lot of information. So I, <laughs> if I could say one thing, yeah, everything can be figured out. And as long as you see someone doing it, if someone's done it, then you can do it too. On the other hand, a thermostat gauges the environment and makes the environment react to it. If a thermostat notices that a room is too cold or too hot, it changes the environment to fit the ideal for which it is set. Similarly, if you encounter external or internal attempts to put constraints on you, you can act like a thermostat to reject those limiting beliefs and create an environment that aligns with your most ambitious goals. So, how do you minimize limiting beliefs and develop a superhero mindset? To me, there are three keys. Key one, name your limiting beliefs. We've seen some examples here of limiting beliefs, but there are many more where those came from. And we'll go over the seven most prevalent limiting beliefs on learning in a moment. They might have to do with your talents, your character, your relationships, your education, or anything else that leads to internal whispers that you can't be what you want to be. Start paying attention right now to every time you tell yourself that you're incapable, even if you think that this particular thing might not be consequential in your life. Maybe you tell yourself that you're terrible at telling jokes. Perhaps this isn't a big deal to you, but because being a good joke teller isn't a personal aspiration, but you might also be telling yourself you don't think you're entertaining or a good company, or an enjoyable companion. And that kind of self-talk can ultimately cause you to double clutch when you're in an important social situation, or when you need to speak in front of a group. 
So listen carefully every time you find yourself using phrases like I can't, I'm not, or I don't. You're sending messages to yourself that are affecting how you think about your life in general, even if what you're beating yourself up over is something specific and seemingly not important to how you define yourself. At the same time, try also to identify the origin of this sort of self-talk. Limiting beliefs often start in childhood. That doesn't automatically mean that your family is their only source. Early social settings can cause limiting beliefs, as can early experiences with education. Some might derive simply because something didn't go well for you the first times you tried it as a kid. Being aware of how you're holding yourself back with your self-talk and spending some time to get to the source of these beliefs is extremely liberating. Because once you're aware, you can begin to realize that these aren't facts about you, but rather opinions. And there's a very good chance that those opinions are wrong. Once you identify the voices in your head that are focusing on what you can't do, start talking back to them. When you find yourself thinking, I always screw up this sort of thing, counter with, just because I haven't always been good at this in the past doesn't mean that I can't be great at it now. Keep your opinions to yourself. Key two, get to the facts. One of the fundamental tyrannies of limiting beliefs is that in so many cases, they're just plain wrong. Are you really terrible at speaking in public? Are you really bad at leading a group? Are you really the least interesting person in the room wherever you are? What's the evidence to support that? How many times have you actually been in these situations and what have the results been? One of the most pernicious things about limiting beliefs is that they play so heavily on our emotions. When you come up against a limiting belief, you're likely to find those beliefs warring and usually winning against your rational self. But how much of this self-talk has a basis in reality? Think about your experiences speaking in public, an extraordinarily common fear, by the way. Rather than focusing on how you felt in these instances, consider how things went. Were you booed off stage? Did people come up to you afterwards to laugh at you and tell you how awful you were? Did your boss sit you down the next day and say that you might want to consider a career where you never had to utter a word? I'm guessing none of these things happened. Instead, it's likely that your audience felt connected to what you were saying. If it were in a professional setting, maybe they were taking notes and you almost certainly taught them something. Does this mean that your next speech should be at TED? Of course not but it definitely means that you're likely much better at conveying information to a group than the voice in your head is telling you that you are. And then there's this question to ask, how much of my perceived poor performance was because my self-talk just wouldn't leave me alone? This is a real issue for many people. They'll be in the middle of doing something in which they lack confidence and the inner critic will become so distracting that they can't focus on what they're doing and therefore don't do it very well. This is one of the reasons why it's so important to learn to face down and quiet your limiting beliefs. The better you are at this, the better you'll be at keeping down distractions during your biggest growth challenges. So when you're examining the facts, behind your limiting beliefs, be sure to consider two things. Whether there is, in reality, any evidence to prove that you are truly hampered in this area, and whether even that evidence was tainted by the noise in your head. Key three, create a new belief. Now that you've given your limiting beliefs a name, and now that you've carefully examined the reality of those beliefs, it's time to take the most essential step to generate a new belief that is both truer than the lies you've been accepting and beneficial to the limitless you that you are creating. You're going to see this process at work in the next chapter, but let's take it for a spin right now. 
Let's say that one of your limiting beliefs is that you always come up short at the most important moments in your life. Having identified that as a limiting belief, you've taken the step of examining the facts. What you realize is that while you have occasionally succumbed to nervousness in pressure-packed moments, very few of these incidences have been disastrous for you. And upon examination, you can think of several times when you came through in the clutch. In fact, now that you really think about it, you've succeeded way more often than you faltered. So, now it's time to create a new belief. In this case, your new belief would be that no one triumphs at the most critical juncture 100% of the time, but that you should be proud of yourself for how many times you performed at your best when the pressure was highest. This new belief completely supplants the old belief is fully supported by the facts and gives you a much healthier mindset the next time a critical situation comes along. I have one more tool for you to use here. I've spoken to many experts over the years and the conversation often comes back to the same thing. As long as you believe that your inner critic is the voice of the true you, the wisest you, it's always going to guide you. Many of us use phrases like, I know myself, and, before announcing a limiting belief. But if you can create a separate persona for your inner critic, one that is different from the true you, you'll be considerably more successful at quieting it. This can be enormously helpful, and you can have fun with it at the same time. Give your inner critic a preposterous name and outrageous physical attributes. Make it cartoonish and unworthy of even a B-grade movie. Mock it for its rigid dedication to negativity. Roll your eyes when it pops into your head. The better you become at distinguishing this voice from the real you, the better you'll be at preventing limiting beliefs from getting in your way. The possibilities become limitless. Now that you know how to conquer your limiting beliefs, you can start to bring your positive mindset to bear on your quest to become limitless. That might sound like an audacious plan, but there's lots of evidence to support the connection between mindset and accomplishment. One of my podcast guests, James Clear, the New York Times bestselling author of Atomic Habits, who you will meet again later in the book, wrote about a study performed by Dr. Barbara Fredrickson, a positive psychology researcher at the University of North Carolina. He prefaced their conversation by underscoring what negative emotions do to us, using the example of encountering a tiger in the forest. Researchers have long known that negative emotions program your brain to do a specific action, he noted. When the tiger crosses your path, for example, you run. The rest of the world doesn't matter. You are focused entirely on the tiger, the fear it creates, and how you can get away from it. The point that Clear is making is that negative emotions drive us to narrow the range of what we are capable of doing. It's all about getting away from the metaphorical tiger, and nothing else matters. If we let negative emotions, such as limiting beliefs, control us, we're regularly operating in survival mode and therefore confined to a reduced range of possibilities. What Dr. Fredrickson discovered is that a positive mindset leads to precisely the opposite result. She created an experiment where participants were divided into five groups and presented with film clips. The first group saw clips that elicited joy. The second saw clips that elicited contentment. The third saw clips that generated fear. And the fourth clips that generated anger. The fifth group was the control group. After they'd seen the clips, the participants were asked to imagine similar situations to what they just saw and how they would react to these situations. They were then asked to fill out a form that had 20 prompts that began with, I would like to. 
The people who experience fear and anger wrote the fewest responses, while those who experience joy and contentment listed far more than even the control group. In other words, Clear noted, when you are experiencing positive emotions like joy, contentment, and love, you will see more possibilities in your life. What's also essential to note is that the benefits of a positive mindset extend well beyond the experience of a positive emotion. Clear offers this example. A child who runs around outside, swinging on branches and playing with friends, develops the ability to move athletically, physical skills, the ability to play with others and communicate with a team, social skills, and the ability to explore and examine the world around them, creative skills. In this way, the positive emotions of play and joy prompt the child to build skills that are useful and valuable in everyday life. The happiness that promoted the exploration and creation of new skills has long since ended, but the skills themselves live on. Limiting beliefs are often revealed in our self-talk, that inner conversation that focuses on what you're convinced you can't do, rather than what you already excel at and what you're going to continue to achieve today and into the future. How often do you stop yourself from attempting to do something or from pursuing a dream because that voice convinces you that it is beyond your reach? If this sounds like you, you are very far from alone, but you're also not doing yourself any favors. We come into this world not knowing if life is hard or easy, if money is scarce or abundant, if we're important or unimportant. We look at two people who know everything, our parents, said belief change expert Shelley Lefko in our podcast interview. Parents are our first teachers, and although they probably meant us no harm, we still come away from our childhoods with the limiting beliefs they unconsciously instilled in us. Limiting beliefs can stop you in your tracks even when you're doing something at which you normally excel. Have you ever had the experience of being in a pressure situation where you need to do something that typically comes easy to you? writing a memo or doing a quick calculation, for example, but the intensity causes you to doubt yourself so much that you fail at this task? That's a limiting belief setting you back. If you could just get out of your own head, you'd have no trouble getting the job done, but your inner voice confounds you. Now, take that situation and extend it to an entire segment of your life your career aspirations, perhaps, or your ability to make friends. If your limiting beliefs are in control, you could find yourself mired in underachievement, either wondering why you never really get ahead or convinced that you don't deserve it. Alexis, who co-founded Quick Learning with me, struggled with learning as a child much like I did, but for very different reasons. She was born in South Korea, to entrepreneurial parents who struggled in business. They didn't have a lot of money, but they always worked hard to make ends meet. While she had a roof over her head, her family of four lived in a one-room basement in Korea. Their second business had just failed when they received a letter from the United States saying their visa application had been approved. They had filed seven years earlier. On the verge of desperation, it seemed like a new chance for the family. So they borrowed the equivalent of $2,000 and left for America. Alexis didn't know a word of English when she arrived. It was total culture shock. She didn't know what was being said around her and the cultural norms were entirely different. Her parents didn't speak English either, so they were all struggling to understand their new world. Alexis enrolled in school near her new home. She was a shy and introverted student, and because she didn't know the language, she often sat alone at the lunch table or ate in a bathroom stall just to avoid feeling like an outcast. 
It took Alexis six years to be able to truly understand English, and both the kids and the teachers in her school didn't understand why she struggled for so long. After a couple of years, classmates started to criticize her for being a slow learner. What's wrong with you? Are you stupid? You're weird. Were phrases she heard frequently as a child. Her difficulties in school even extended to physical education, the one area where she ostensibly didn't need to use many words. She remembers sitting on the bleachers, repeatedly copying out the words. I will bring my gym clothes to class, but she had no idea what she was writing, and no one managed to communicate to her that she needed to bring a change of clothing. By the time she was in her early twenties, Alexis had a hard time reading a book front to back. She battled with her internal voices whenever she attempted to learn. One overarching voice constantly criticized and doubted her abilities, while another small voice questioned that critic. Something inside her couldn't fully accept the notion that she was dumb. Her parents worked hard to give her a second chance, and she couldn't let them down. While there were moments where she felt she wasn't good enough to do anything special in her life. There were also moments where she was sure there had to be more to life than merely accepting her circumstances. If Alexis allowed those internal voices to shape her reality, then it would have stopped her in her tracks. She wouldn't have searched for solutions to her problems. Instead, she looked for answers by observing and learning from others. She started wondering. What they were doing differently to find success and happiness, she wanted to know if it was sheer luck and genius, or if there was a method behind it. In her quest to learn how to be successful, she ended up in one of my early classes. She wasn't sure what she was getting into, but she knew she wanted something different for herself. She needed to feel a sense of hope. On day one, we covered memory. It was eight hours of intense training, but at the end of the session, Alexis felt refreshed and even excited about what she was learning. How else can I use my brain? She wondered. For the first time in her life, she didn't feel slow, and she felt excited about learning. Day two was all about speed reading. She wasn't initially excited about this because of her previous challenges. But when Alexis started the smart reading habits and went through the speed reading exercises, a light bulb turned on. She suddenly saw the potential and even the fun of reading. She realized she was not too slow or stupid to understand. She was just never shown how to learn and use the supercomputer between her ears. As she experienced the power of learning, the years of negative self-talk and limiting belief took a backseat in her mind. After that class, Alexis read a complete book for the first time and was blown away by how much she understood, how much she remembered, and how much she liked the experience. It was a huge turning point in her life. She went from a limited mindset, believing that things are the way they are. To knowing that she could change and shape her mind to reach her goals, for the first time in her life, she began to believe in herself and imagine what might be possible. Today, Alexis doesn't shy away from learning something new. She doesn't feel inadequate if she doesn't know something. She goes out to find answers and applies them. Out of her passion for learning, she started Quick Learning Online with me to share the transformation she experienced with others in every country in the world. In their book *Equilibrium*, authors Jan Bruce, Dr. Andrew Chate, and Dr. Adam Perlman called these kinds of beliefs iceberg beliefs because of how many of them lie beneath the surface of our subconscious. 
Iceberg beliefs are deep-rooted and powerful, and they fuel our emotions, they say in the book. The more entrenched an iceberg is, the more havoc it wreaks on your life. Creating your schedule chaos, getting in the way of successfully sticking to a diet, or holding you back from seizing opportunities. And perhaps most significantly, they say, if we get a handle on our icebergs, we gain an enormous amount of control over our feelings and our lives. Melt an iceberg and all the downstream events it causes get washed away as well. I like that. I mean, I feel like we could wrap the book up right here because that core belief, you know, we talk about that our life is directed by our thoughts and having a core belief saying that we could figure this out, that there is a, a solution, that there is an answer. I think that's very important because it gives you hope, mm -hmm. right? To be able to move forward and a belief in yourself, even when it's not supported by the people close to us, because I know a lot of people contact our office all the time and just saying, you know, hey, I'm, I'm not, I feel alone in this process. You know, I, I want to learn. I'm listening to your podcasts. And I'm reading this book, but my family doesn't get it, or my spouse mm -hmm. doesn't get it. You know, or my parents, they, they don't get it, or my coworkers, you know, and I want more. And part of this belief chapter is about believing you deserve it. Mm -hmm. You know, do you feel like some people, they, um, they hold back because they, they don't believe it's either possible or that they, they're worth it? Yeah, and I definitely had that too. Out of anybody, I was like the biggest critic of myself. And I think more than other people even sometimes. And I felt like, no, you don't deserve that. No, you know, you can't do that. What are you talking about? And I've, I really had to work through and I was trying to think of like, where is that coming from? Like, where did I learn that from? Like, who did I pick that up from? I mean, I'm not going to lie. It took many years of rechecking in with myself, trying to practice self-love that didn't work for a long time um, until I started to prove to myself by doing simple little things, just applying, doing simple little things. I'm like, okay, I said I was going to do that, and I did that, and that was good. <laughs> and it started with that small step and just keep proving to myself that I could do what I said I would do. That started to change the dialogue in my mind slowly, but it really took a lot of practice and a lot of like, consistent work through little small actions. Yeah, I think those little small actions lit up, lead to big, big, big things. You know, we, we came to this at different points in our lives, you know, whether it's a traumatic brain injury or coming to a new country where you don't know people or know the language. You know, I know you had your own challenges with education. And how important is it that people commit themselves to, to learning all the time? So important. <laughs> oh my God. It's the, I mean, it's the foundation of our business and I feel like it's the foundation of us because mm -hmm. even becoming a new mom, I did not stop learning. I know it gets crazy and even if it's like 10, 15 minutes of just being in the bathroom, you know, getting ready, I would listen to audiobooks I, I constant I had to engage my mind like just because something changed like I couldn't like step back and I think I I was li maybe a little bit too aggressive in the beginning I think I should have you know allowed myself to have some rest first you know before doing that again but I was so I was so eager to not let go of that you know at any circumstances so I had to make that like a priority you know in my life or no matter what stage you're in, no matter what you're doing, you have to be learning and engaging in your mind with something every day, even if it's like 10, 15 minutes, like every day. And that was non-negotiable for me. Yeah, I, I, that's a great word, non-negotiable. Because when we have our mindsets, you have the things to do and the things that you just, that you must do, you know, no matter what, to be able to take care of, of yourself. And it's mm -hmm. interesting, you know, when I know you're part of your story, how you got out of it was self-education. Mm -hmm. And maybe you weren't getting it through a traditional education and you, 
you know, you you studied sciences and different areas, and then you started going to conferences and watching these videos, reading these books, listening to these audiobooks, and now you're actually producing all these things for other people. <laughs> you're producing large conferences for our students around the world. You're producing these online courses, the you know our, our high-rated podcasts, and now you know you're you're in an audiobook when you used to be <laughs> listening to audiobooks. Uh, which we, you know, we both still do, and you've, you, you've built this life where you and your family, you've lived all around the world, and you're having this amazing impact. You know, as you're thinking about your your child, how um, how are you thinking about it from a mother's standpoint right now? Like, how would you think about? You know, we should probably do a follow up to this book on Limitless for for children, and I know we mm-hmm. wrote a. Uh, bonus chapter actually on parenting on how to be able to share some of these techniques because how wonderful is it that your child is learning this not only is she you know picking up different languages and everything but she and being exposed to lots of stimulus but you know what a gift to have that as at an early age because i know you and i would have done anything had those those skills Exactly. It's one thing that I'm constantly mindful of. I mean, of course, as a parent, I have to set certain boundaries too. But at the same time, I don't want her to feel like she's not able to do something, or she's not good enough, or she's not loved. And always, you know, learning. Luckily, all children love learning. It's just that sometimes it's stifled by others when they're growing up. And we want to make sure that we create a right environment for her to experiment, grow, but at the same time, you know, <laughs> having certain rules and having that discipline, that's also important too. And, mm. you know, a lot of times being limitless, I feel like it's not about having no rules and boundaries. I think being limitless is knowing you know, knowing yourself and having those, you know, boundaries and discipline mm. so that you can be more free to do what you want to do. Dr. Janice Vilhauer, director of Emory University's Adult Outpatient Psychotherapy Program in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Science in the School of Medicine, implores us to come face to face with our inner critic. The voice in your head that judges you, doubts you, belittles you, and constantly tells you that you are not good enough. It says negative, hurtful things to you, things that you would never even dream of saying to anyone else. I am such an idiot. I am a phony. I never do anything right. I will never succeed. She adds, the inner critic isn't harmless. It inhibits you, limits you, and stops you from pursuing the life you truly want to live. It robs you of peace of mind and emotional well-being. And if left unchecked long enough, it can lead to serious mental health problems like depression or anxiety. Let's revisit our failed superhero from the beginning of this chapter. She certainly had the motivation to save the day, and she certainly had the methods to save the day. But what she didn't have was the mindset. Her inner critic convinced her that she wasn't good enough. So she sat on the sidelines feeling sorry for herself instead of taking care of business. Certainly, one takeaway from the story is that our failed superhero blew it. She flopped at a critical time because she couldn't get out of her own head. But there is another hugely important component of this story. Our superhero had everything inside of her to succeed. If only she'd been able to prevail over the beliefs that were holding her back, her extraordinary talents would have shown through. That's how important it is to conquer your limiting beliefs. What if I told you that you were a genius? When you think of geniuses, who are the first people that come to mind? I'm guessing Einstein and Shakespeare are on your short list. Others might include Stephen Hawking, Bill Gates, 
Marie Curie or Ruth Bader Ginsburg. These names pop into many people's heads because each of them was extraordinary in the kinds of intelligence we tend to equate with genius. But was LeBron James on your list? How about Beyonce or Oprah or you? It wouldn't be surprising if you didn't include the latter names on your list. Most of us tend to equate genius with one particular measurement of intelligence, IQ. People with outsized IQs are geniuses and people with lesser IQs can be good or even great at something, but they're not considered geniuses. If this sounds like your kind of thinking, you're far from alone in defining genius far, far too narrowly. I would even take this to the point of suggesting that most people define genius in this way. But there are two problems with that. One is that it prevents you from appreciating the genius a wide variety of people hold. The other is that it might prevent you from identifying the genius in yourself. There are multiple forms of genius. Various experts differ on the number, but it is commonly agreed that genius expresses itself in one of four manners. Here's a way of looking at it that has been around for thousands of years. Dynamo genius. Those who express their genius through creativity and ideas. Shakespeare was a dynamo genius because of his brilliance at inventing stories that told us so much about ourselves. Galileo was a dynamo genius because of the way he could see things that others couldn't see when he looked up at the skies. Dynamo geniuses are those we most commonly think of when we think of geniuses. Blaze genius. Those whose genius comes clear through their interaction with others. Oprah Winfrey is a blaze genius because of her extraordinary ability to connect with the hearts, minds, and souls of a wide range of individuals. Malala Yousafzai's blaze genius expresses itself through her ability to make her story relatable to people all around the globe. Blaze geniuses tend to be master communicators. Tempo genius. Those whose genius expresses itself through their ability to see the big picture and stay the course. Nelson Mandela was a tempo genius because he was capable of seeing the wisdom of his vision even in the face of overwhelming odds. Mother Teresa's tempo genius allowed her to imagine better circumstances for those around her, even at the darkest times. Tempo geniuses tend to understand the long view in ways that most of those around them cannot. Steel genius. Those who are brilliant at sweating the small stuff and doing something with the details that others missed or couldn't envision. Sergey Brin used his genius at seeing the potential of large amounts of data to co-found Google. If you read the book Moneyball, then you know that Billy Bean and his staff redefined baseball through their genius at crunching data. Steel geniuses love getting all the information they can get and have a vision for doing something with that information that most others miss. Quick start. What would you say is your genius? Write it down in your notepad. There's a very good chance that your own genius is a combination of two or more of these. Very few of us are only data people or are only adept at being empathetic. But what's important for you to understand here is that genius extends far beyond your ability to excel at academics or recite the periodic table on command and that you have genius inside of you. If you find that last statement surprising, you might want to go back and reread some of the earlier chapters in this book. Making yourself limitless is all about unleashing your innate 
genius. Maybe you aren't the dynamo of Shakespeare or the blaze of Oprah, but there is some combination of genius inside of you that is either waiting to express itself or waiting to express itself more. The key is letting it free. It isn't only in your head. Before I give you some tools to help you shift toward a more positive mindset, let's just talk for a minute about how important positive thinking is. There are clear connections between positive thinking and physical health. In a John Hopkins study, Dr. Lisa Yannick found that positive people from the general population were 13% less likely than their negative counterparts to have a heart attack or other coronary event. Meanwhile, the Mayo Clinic notes that the positive thinking that usually comes from optimism is a key part of effective stress management. And effective stress management is associated with many health benefits. They note that these benefits include increased lifespan, lower rates of depression, lower levels of distress, greater resistance to the common cold, better psychological and physical well-being, better cardiovascular health, and reduced risk of death from cardiovascular disease, better coping skills during hardships and times of stress. Reframing Limiting Beliefs There's a metaphor I've always found useful when helping people to move away from limiting beliefs. I tell them that the difference between limiting beliefs and a limitless mindset is like the difference between a thermometer and a thermostat. A thermometer has only one function, to react to the environment. It reads the temperature and nothing more. This is similar to how people commonly react to limiting beliefs. They read their sense of restriction, react in a constrained way to that, and conduct their lives in a limited way. That is so profound that having setting limits and constraints and boundaries can make you more limitless. Yeah, I truly believe that. And after becoming a mom, and of course I couldn't do the things that I used to do before, you know, before traveling everywhere, going to all the events. Now that's not there anymore. But I'm so much more efficient at using my time mm -hmm. because of those constraints. My level of focus has gone up, mm -hmm. my discipline, everything. And I actually feel more fulfilled because of it, because I have those constraints and because I can actually do the things that I need to do. Also, we're going we're gonna to talk about this in the upcoming section on motivation. You know, I noticed that when somebody is counting on you, that your mm -hmm. motivation, your drive is, I mean, yeah. you, you worked hard before, and now you're this, you're this exceptional mother, nobody's perfect, and your drive to, 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 to be more, to do more, is even more clearer because you have even more of a reason because, mm -hmm. because there's a child that's, that's counting on you. That's true. <laughs> and by the way, we, Alexis and I, co-wrote a bonus chapter for anybody who has a child in their life. So for any parents that are listening, wondering, how can I apply this towards parenting? Instead of waiting for children to adopt these limiting beliefs, you know, and unlearning them, which is a process, you know, what can we do early on? And we also not only did that for parents, we also co-wrote a chapter on business you know you run a business with we have teammates um internationally all around the world uh, most of them happen to be female amazing women on on the team so mm -hmm. entrepreneurship you've always been an entrepreneur like i have and so we wrote a chapter also on not only people could get it at limitlessbook.com forward slash parenting and one limitlessbook.com forward slash business applying limitless techniques you know as you have with our team to make them limitless and and lifelong learner in order for anybody 
who's listening to this, who has a business, in order for your business to grow, your team has to grow. The takeaways for me in this conversation is no matter where you start, you know, we can't control what happened necessarily in the past, but we can control things right now. And mm -hmm. it doesn't help to blame our circumstances because it gives our power, it puts our power outside of us. But if you could go through your life and you have a personal vision for yourself, you believe in yourself, d despite of what everyone around tells you, because there might not be any evidence to the case, and you know that you could figure it out, unless as, as long as you don't give up, and as, as you look at challenges, not as something to get in your way or pain to get in your way, it's just embrace it, learn from it, that pain and challenges are a signal that we need to prepare, that we need to grow, that we need to get better and, and have faith in yourself as you move forward and find the meaning, what, what lights you up, whether it's, it's growing, whether it's your, your family and having a clear vision for the impact that you want to be able to make. And, um, and Alexis, I just want to thank you for the, the impact that you've made, you know, in, in, in our, and me personally, and, uh, and making this book possible, making, you know, our mission possible. And I share the same vision as two people who had learning difficulties that were marginalized in a certain way. I think everybody could relate to somebody who feels like they were held back or they were called stupid or that mm -hmm. they were bullied or they had some kind of advantage. And ultimately, none of that matters. It's not in our history. It's what we do right now, mm -hmm. you know, and what we commit to right now. And then, then that's really what, what we're here to do. And so thank you. And so I, I, I want to thank everybody for listening to this section. Um, and I also want to thank you <laughs> for bringing me on for this section. And it was uncomfortable, but I'm really glad that I did it. <laughs> yeah, well, this is, this is the thing. This is the first public thing we've, we've done together. And you're a living example of what you teach. You know, you know and Limitless is not about being fearless. It's about feeling the fear and you still do it anyway because being limitless is playing and practicing at the edge mm -hmm. of your our comfort zones. And if you're always comfortable all the time, that means you're just not growing. And so, and, and I know because we had this conversation that there's somebody listening to this right now that they, they feel hope. Mm -hmm. You know, that they're in that place where they feel this darkness and it helps them to know that they're not alone that somebody else has been there and is there for them. And um, that's really what we're in for. You know, we're, we're here because we're here to do it together. And that if you're a little bit different, that's probably to your advantage because <laughs> you're a living example. Your mess has become your message. You know, that people can break through. They can have an, an exceptional life. You know, not just the kids that were labeled exceptional, but everybody could be exceptional in their own way as long as they don't give up and they have this mindset that everything can be figured out.